one more time, lest they divide us. This is Deus Ex, Mankind Divided. Beginning with easily the most cinematic opening in the series, we see high-speed jets flying over the ruins of Dubai, while our old friend and colleague Eliza Kassan reports on terror attacks committed by augmented people and references the incident two years ago. We barely have time to take in this breathtaking scenery before we are pulled aboard one of the jets and find it loaded with a heavily armed fire team, rocking camo uniforms, body armor, automatic weapons, and designer scar tissue before our eyes finally rest on the heavily augmented frame of Adam Jensen. And we get a hint of some, shall we say, stressed working relationships? But this isn't some lengthy cinematic intro made with pre-rendered HD film. We quickly realize we are already playing the game. Jensen is now working for Interpol, and one of their deep cover agents has managed to set up an arms deal between a terrorist cell and an ex Tower agent named Shepard. No, not that one. And it's time to move in and arrest them all. But time is of the essence. With a sandstorm rapidly moving in and the enemy dug in well, it's up to Jensen to divide the main force and cut off their communications so that the main fire team can make the arrest. And just like that, our hero chooses his weapon loadout and gets to work. And while this is our tutorial mission, I can tell you that anyone coming to this off the back of Human Revolution will have no problem getting to grips with the new tightened up control system and may even appreciate the changes made to the stun gun. But things go south when at the moment of the arrest, gold masked figures appear from nowhere to disrupt the deal and all hell breaks loose. With the sandstorm barreling in and guns blazing everywhere, Adam rushes to ground the helicopter and prevent the enemy from escaping. And just as he takes a moment to breathe a sigh of relief, the walls come crashing down. And so, for the last time, we are thrust into another tangled network of mystery and conspiracy. What starts with a train station bombing in Prague will send Adam hunting down extremists, dealing with corrupt police fueled by prejudice against the augmented, facing off against powerful crime bosses, flying to the Swiss Alps and storming a summit held in London to prevent terrorists from murdering thousands and creating a rift so wide between humans and the augmented that it might never be healed again. Alongside this, he must uncover the mystery of how new augmentations became attached to his body and face off against deeper questions of who he is and what is his place in the world. Does he stand for justice in the face of corruption? Does he succumb to urges of violence and revenge? Or does he rise above it all to become a true exemplar of something far greater? There may be one major problem with this story, that being its somewhat abrupt cliffhanger ending, but what we get from the start until then is on par with everything else we've seen in this series so far. We open on a dark room and see a gathering of people that those of us familiar with this series will no doubt recognize, or at least have some idea about. The Illuminati are gathered here, led by the supreme mastermind and one-man think tank Lucius De Beers, a man whose fate a few of us will know about. I will remember these small injustices when I am revived. <laughs> As always though, the intro talks in cryptic riddles that will not make much sense until later in the game. The old power seems truly intent on ending augmentation after their failing with Hugh Darrow in the previous game. They are now banking on something called the Human Restoration Act to pass, which would see the augmented having their upgrades forcibly removed from them or have them shipped off to segregation camps and they are more than happy to throw their near limitless supply of cash at getting their way. 
but a much younger and slimmer Morgan Everett is not so convinced that this outcome can simply be bought. The web spinner, however, has plans within plans layered on top of each other. The only name mentioned in fear is that of Janus and his hacker group called the Juggernaut Collective, a group we've already met once, who are more than happy to make life difficult for the Illuminati. To this end, a second plan is set into motion, one involving a far more dangerous man than any of them know. Bob Page once again takes center stage as our villain. Young and handsome, he is ready to wreak havoc on their enemies as he is given the order to attack. Page, activate the sleep cell. And with those final words ringing in our ears, we see a high-speed train charging through beautiful European scenery and see Adam Jensen awaken from a long sleep. Keep an eye on this face. It'll come back later. The train pulls in and Adam finds himself at a station filled with faceless armed police rocking seriously powerful looking hardware and making spot identification checks on orgs. Now, where have I seen this before? Prague, it seems, has taken a hard stance on its augmented population since the incident two years ago, and what starts here could spread across the entire world. And as Adam crosses the platform, he goes to help what at first seems to be a stranger in need, but soon turns out to be something else entirely. This is Alex. Not that one. Alex Vega. And she is a hacker in the Juggernaut Collective. We discover that they are the ones who have put Jensen into Task Force 29, as they believe it is an Illuminati front, and the elusive man, not that one, Janus, wants Adam to place a bug on the Task Force's VR communications network. But before we can get deeper into this intrigue, all hell breaks loose. We awaken later in Adam's apartment, and get a little time to explore. This is an immersive sim after all, and that means interaction. Adam's home is full of little hints and memories of his past life, as well as being in need of a good clean. The best part is that more of these turn up later if you look carefully enough. Adam has to get to work, but before he can, there's one important thing he needs to take care of. I don't know what it is about this conversation with Sarif. But there's a real sense of loss in it, even when talking about Pritchard. A friend described it as Lonely X Syndrome, saying you never realize how much you miss having him shout at you. We are soon out onto the beautiful streets of Prague, and our senses are assaulted with all manner of beauty and agony. This game doesn't waste time throwing its side missions at you either. From dealing with organized crime bosses, to helping orcs to get counterfeit papers so they can stay in the city, this game wants you to explore it and find all its hidden little secrets. The detail here is truly mind-blowing, but we'll talk about Prague later. For now, Adam has two main objectives. He has his rendezvous at work to plant the Whisper Chip, and he needs to find out why his augmentations are playing up and have basically factory reset. The first objective leads Adam to a Ripper Doc, who I wouldn't exactly trust with a knife. However, when what should be a routine system check has Adam waking up in great pain, he is confronted with the information that numerous new upgrades have been grafted onto his frame, and that the handiwork wasn't all that clean. This mystery seems to link back to when Adam was pulled out of the ocean after the Panchea incident, and spent a long time bedridden in a hospital in Alaska. And while following up on this will play a role later, for now, there's nothing to do other than live with the changes and get to work. As usual, our home base is also our unofficial tutorial level, loaded with all the little interactions that make an immersive sim so immersive, and is a really fun little place to explore and has plenty of little easter eggs to find. I don't know why you go into the ladies room and I don't want to know. It's your business, just make sure no one else sees you. By the way, Ditton, stay out of the ladies restroom. That kind of activity embarrasses the agency more than it does you. With the Whisper Chip installed, Jensen is called into the office of Miller, who does not seem too happy about his last cyberspace meeting. Between the Dubai operation going south and the bombing, he's got a lot to be upset about. Jensen is assigned to investigate the bombing. The only problem is 
the police don't want to play nice with Interpol, and certainly not their pet augmented human. Meaning if Adam wants to find any evidence, he's going to have to do what Adam does best. With the data secured and in the forensics lab for examination, Adam is now tasked with heading to Gollum City. Before the incident, this was a haven for the new influx of augmented workers coming to Prague, and after the incident has become a poverty-filled slum, policed with the utmost brutality. It's also the base of operations for the Augmentation Rights Coalition, or ARC for short, and their charismatic leader, Talos Rucker. Given the tension between humans and orgs in Prague, Rucker and Ark are now prime suspects for the terrorist attack, and Adam has been sent to bring him in for questioning. After working around the police and securing a route, Adam makes his way to the upper levels, where he first encounters a very dangerous looking org indeed. Viktor Marchenkov has final boss written all over his face, and he very openly threatens Adam about proceeding through this part of the complex. With a bit of work though, Adam is able to reach his target and try to convince him to come in for questioning. Rocker, however, seems more than a little clued up on who is pulling into Paul's strings and what will happen if he does go in. However, before this conversation can reach any kind of resolution, things go bad. I mean, you can do much worse than taking cues from the Metal Gear series. With Rucker dead and the entire ghetto moving in on his location, Jensen makes a fast exit and returns to Prague to hand in his report. The city is now swathed in darkness, and the famous nightlife is now in full swing. Our second round in Prague sees Jensen following up on the forensic evidence from the train station to track down the bomber for TF-29, and for the Juggernaut Collective, investigating if Miller is in fact working for the Illuminati. The first objective ends when Jensen finds the bomb maker's father, who has actually been sheltering her and brings him in for questioning. The second mission has us actually breaking into the VR construct where Miller meets with his superiors and extracting data from a previous conversation and... Why, Mr. Manderley, were you ever thin? Remind me, how did our last meeting go? Miller clearly isn't happy with the orders regarding Rucker, and suspects that Ark is being set up to take the fall without evidence. But this conversation doesn't end when he leaves, and... Well, well, well. Hello, Bob. You're looking good. Telegram from the future. I give you life! I... This conversation reveals that Mr. Page has a man inside Ark, and that he is responsible for killing Rucker using something called the Orchid. To gain more information on this weapon, Alex tells Jensen that VersaLife has a vault in the impregnable Palisade Bank, that could contain evidence they need, but that the vault is going to be cleared out tonight. With time of the essence, Jensen rushes to the bank, only to be contacted by the bomb maker's father, who has escaped from Interpol and is desperately scared for his daughter's well-being, saying she could be killed any minute now. Jensen has to choose to either break into the bank and uncover the truth of the orchid, or break into the crazed machine cult run apartments and try to save the bomb maker so he can find out more about her role in the terror attack. Each choice will have its benefits and consequences, but they will both implicate Mr. Marchenko as the bombing mastermind and locate him in a base in Switzerland that seems far too expensive and organized for a coalition like ARC. Suspecting conspiracy, Miller sends Adam to the Swiss Alps alone to gather intel on the location, but things go very bad, very quickly. In true Bond villain style, Marchenko doesn't simply put a bullet through Adam's titanium skull, but instead injects him with the orchid and tosses him out with the garbage to die a slow death from augmentation rejection. Except that Adam Jensen is Megan Reed's patient X, a product of VersaLife genetic research whose body doesn't reject augmentations. This gives Adam the upper hand. As now believed to be dead, he is able to infiltrate the base and move silently through the gold-masked extremist splinter faction of Ark, gather intel, and get back to Prague to report on what he's found. Another attack is coming. A big one. But Prague is now under full lockdown, 
and the police have been given full sanction to use this as a chance to thin out the augmented population in the city. Jensen must investigate a connection between Marchenko and the Diwali crime syndicate, discover they are the ones moving the bombs, and their target is a massive conference in London where billionaire Nathaniel Brown is going to speak out against the Human Restoration Act. Having augmented rights activists commit mass murder at an event like this would utterly destroy any chance of sealing the breach between humans and orgs, and is exactly what the Illuminati wants. Jensen has to work fast to secure the Apex Center, stop the attendees from drinking champagne laced with the orchid poison, and bring down Marchenko before he blows up the surrounding buildings and murders thousands of innocent lives. If he's fast, maybe he can save everyone, but if not, it could all go quickly to hell. Despite the fact this is clearly what we call a potboiler story that was intended to be finished at a later date, this is still a wild adventure, and once again, the writing and characters really work to invest us in this story. And with our story clearly laid out, it's time to talk about the world of Mankind Divided. While most Deus Ex games take place across exotic locations around the world, Mankind Divided, but for a couple of brief excursions to the Swiss Alps and London, takes place almost exclusively in Prague. This was a bold move on behalf of the devs, who clearly figured that this time, a single, larger central hub world would allow for richer storytelling overall. It also probably aided with development costs and time, as assets could be shared across almost all locations. We are after all now in the era of HD gaming and physically based rendering, so game art isn't cheap. Certainly, something is lost by having less variety in locations, but something is gained here too. We visit Prague during three distinct time periods. The daytime, where we first begin our exploration of the city, at night, when the red light district is open, and the last time during lockdown, where the overbearing police presence transforms this safe haven of storytelling and exploration into the game's most sprawling, and dare I say dangerous dungeon especially for those who prefer stealth to combat. I've talked in previous retrospectives about how Deus Ex has two distinctly different zones, hub worlds and dungeons. In the first game, for example, the first visit to Hell's Kitchen is clearly a hub world, while the rooftops where you go in search of the generator are clearly a dungeon. However, as the game progresses, the line gets more than a little blurry. This is very much the case here in MD2. There are actually very few hostile dungeon areas overall, with the danger rising organically out of situations rather than by simply entering a combat level. Prague is filled with an insane amount of environmental storytelling, and each time we visit we get to see a distinctly different face of the city. On top of that, many of the side quests have something of a chapter-like structure, progressing at each stage in the game and giving them more depth. A few of these will even intersect with the main story, and have an impact on things there. A couple of standout examples are how you can aid Otar Botkavali, the second in command of the Diwali crime family, as part of one quest, and discover later that your help led to him becoming the head of the family, and rendering an entire late game area safe and friendly for you. Likewise, helping out the rogue sentient variant of the AI Eliza Kassan will lead to her causing a distraction for you later on, allowing you to bypass a difficult police barricade. On a side note here, I consider myself a fairly low body count player, but, well, I don't care if you do help out JC in the future, you don't send armed men in suits after my favourite AI waifu. I mean, just look at the way Adam reacts upon seeing her, retracting his augmented vision to look at her with his real eyes, and my my, is he flirting with her? Of course, you have dialogue choices, but play certain ones and this reunion will be very touching indeed. Oh. And the moment I catch anyone trying to pull a jigsaw on me, well, if you've watched my RE7 retrospective, you know how I feel about that. These stories and this world are deep and engaging, and are only topped by one location in the whole game. I am of course talking about Gollum City. It's a real shame that we only come here once, and only for one mission. If I could change one thing about this game, I would bring people back here a lot more, because wow, this place. The story of Gollum City starts years before Mankind Divided, when a pro-augmentation government set up a housing complex and sanctuary for the large influx of augmented workers it was inviting to boost economic growth. This place was called the Utilek Complex, 
and was supposed to be a haven, but in the wake of the org incident and the transfer of power to an anti-org government in Prague, it was transformed into a ghetto where unlicensed orgs would be deported to. The nickname Gollum City is a slur like Clank, and the police here are absolutely brutal. We discover early on that neuropazine is restricted for no reason, and that most people here all live in some kind of chronic pain, and it's clearly seen everywhere we look. This city has a better post-apocalyptic vibe than any post-apocalyptic game I've ever played. It is a total mess of cables and machines, all smashed together to look like a plug socket with far too many adapters and extensions jammed into it. All around us we see the pain people are dealing with, in the dirt and the rust. The way everything is broken or in some state of disrepair. There's nothing new here, nothing safe. The people walk with their heads bowed and steer clear of police brutality, not wanting to get involved for fear of drawing attention to themselves. This is a place where people disappear at night, and the fates are only whispered of. This is the ultimate endpoint of prejudice and separation. This is true hell on earth. The upper levels, known as the throat, are the layer of Talos Rucker and the Augmentation Rights Coalition. And while they are all well-armed, augmented, and seemingly willing and ready to fight, they don't. Rocker makes it clear he doesn't want any kind of violent response from his people. And while I actually agree with his principles, I mean, he lives at the top of the tower, above the pollution and the pain. He doesn't deal with police brutality on a daily basis. He knows when they come for him, he'll see it coming. Or at least, he thought he would. If I could make any kind of mod for this game, I would make more of this city. There are so many stories to be told here, and quite a few to find, like one apartment where we find what seems to be a murder-suicide that no one has reported or seems to care about. You can dig deeper into what happened here and the story is, well, devastating. Much of MD's gameplay is very much the same as it was in Human Revolution, with only a few tweaks here and there to tighten things up. Adam moves through cover in a more realistic and less stylish way, which in my book is kind of a minus, but not a deal breaker by any means. The shooting in the combat overall feels tighter too, and for me at least, worked just as well in first person shooter mode as it did in third person cover mode. By 2016, gaming's love affair with cover based shooters was dwindling, and Wolfenstein The New Order and later Doom 2016 were showing us what we'd been missing while we'd been hiding behind chest high walls. The biggest addition though are Adam's new orgs. These are quite well integrated through the meta narrative, and their discovery also jumpstarts a couple of other side quests. In the wake of the Panchea incident at the end of Human Revolution, Adam spent some time unconscious in a medical facility in Alaska, where it seems certain doctors actually installed a suite of new military grade powers in him, but didn't do a particularly good job of it. As such, should all of them be brought online, Adam's power cells would overheat and he'd promptly explode or something to that effect. So, in order for the player to bring the new systems online, they need to shut down others. This effectively means they have to consider both a build and a loadout, at least until a little after the halfway point in the game, when Jensen can get the neuroplasticity mod installed and have unrestricted access to everything in his arsenal. Now, to be fair, you don't need to use these new abilities much at all. You'll be just fine rebuilding the same Adam you made in Human Revolution, which is actually what I did through most of the game. But some of these new toys are really fun to use, so I'd recommend you give them a try. They take the shape of combat and mobility enhancements. My biggest problem with the combat ones is actually my main gripe with the whole idea of having a weapon grafted into you. That is to say, how is that any more efficient than simply holding them with your hands? The Tesla charge for instance basically does the same as the stun gun. Now yes, this can be upgraded with a few whistles and bells, but overall I don't see how it's any more or less useful than having a stun gun aside from freeing up some space in your inventory. Likewise with the nanoblades, sure, it's cool you can fire these things out of your arms, but they do the same as a silenced pistol. It's almost like being a supreme dark wizard or something, and having your main spell do exactly what people have been doing with bows and arrows and other basic ranged weapons throughout history. The peps gun is something a little different, but I recall having one of these in my inventory while playing Human Revolution, so again, 
I can take it or leave it. The mobility augmentations, however, are something else entirely. The Icarus Dash is useful in both stealth and combat, and what's cool is you even see late game enemies using it too, and the remote hacking is an absolute godsend, especially during the lockdown in Prague, when you have robots on the ground and in the sky searching for you, as well as laser tripwire and cameras just pointed at doors you need to get through for no good reason. A quick side note here, I love that we get to see robots that look like Deus Ex-1 robots in the game too. So overall, the new orgs are solid, welcome additions that are going to boost any existing playstyle, and maybe even open the door to a few more. Now, the level design is probably where I have to talk a little smack about this game. I said before how I always like to take my time to really explore an area and find that one hidden little route that can bypass all the enemies and cameras without ever firing a shot or being seen. And while those little nooks and crannies definitely exist, it was really frustrating to search around some areas to find I was being hard railroaded through a confrontation where I basically had the choice of fight or cloak. Time and again, I'd think I'd found some useful air vent, only to have it bring me out somewhere useless. Or I'd try slipping through a sewer entrance only to find the bottom filled with poison gas. During the lockdown, for example, you are frequently funneled through heavily guarded checkpoints to get into and out of subway stations, and most of these stations don't have side or back doors into them. Up until the lockdown as well, the game does a pretty good job of not making you jump needlessly between Prague's districts and deal with loading screens to complete side quest objectives. But at this point, there's a lot of that too. The themes of Deus Ex are many, from conspiracy and corruption, to media manipulation, human experimentation, and transhumanism. In the style of all good science fiction though, things that are real possibilities are explored into their most extreme outcomes. Transhumanism, for example, is the idea that humans are so inseparable from their tools that they will one day ultimately join with them as a way to transcend the limitations of their biological bodies. Carbon-based life, after all, needs a very specific environment to survive in and has a limited lifespan that is at best beset with strife, from environmental hazards to disease. An AI, on the other hand, would never know such problems, and were it safely installed in a satellite with sufficient power, could sail the stars for all time. Transhuman theory puts forward the idea that our minds will become like those of AIs, and be stored on powerful drives, allowing us to inhabit any number of bodies, both mechanical and organic. The incredible book and Netflix series Altered Carbon dives deep into this, with human minds traveling across the stars faster than the speed of light to be installed into bodies waiting for them on far off planets. Another transhuman idea is that of cybernetic enhancements similar to what we see in this series. It's one of the persistent features of the cyberpunk genre, with people rocking chrome like tattoos. I think this is less likely overall, but in science fiction, and in Mankind Divided specifically, it's used to represent a kind of social divide. In the early days of human augmentation, it's only the elites of the world that can afford the surgery and medication involved in the process. The elites in this way gain an even stronger edge over the rest of the world by having bodies and brains that can perform on a higher level to everyone else. As augmentation becomes more accepted and mainstream, people who can't afford or who simply don't want to become augmented find themselves falling behind in career development and other areas. Another metaphor is the Illuminati, who represent a more conservative mindset. Augmentation means a shift in power, and if that were to happen, they couldn't be sure they'd be on top of the pile when the dust settled. This seems to be their primary motivation in wanting harsher regulations and to even outright strip it out of the world. The augmented people in Deus Ex have a rebellious look to them, and seem to represent more liberal mindsets that welcome change and fight against oppressive forces. The quintessential cyberpunk, or street samurai, is the mercenary who is a law unto themselves, that rocks designer augmentation and fights against oppressive corporate powers that seek to keep the world as docile consumers while they commit their business unchecked and without consequence. These people feel their hardware completes them in a way that their biological bodies alone never could that through augmentation, they are able to express themselves and live their lives in the most honest and natural way for them. And if that's the case, is there any real reason to deny them that? 
or to try to take it from them by force. In Adam's case, military-grade augmentation literally saved his life and transformed him into an unstoppable force capable of saving Megan and bringing the people who kidnapped her to justice. Maybe he never asked for this, but he also embraced what he became. These themes are all reflections of the real world in some way and can give us pause to think on each one, but the moral ambiguity of many of the choices we make in Deus Ex means that we aren't beaten over the head with any particular ideology or morality. To put it simply, if you tell someone their point of view is wrong, regardless of what facts you display, they're likely just going to double down on it. Give them a chance to explore what other points of view there are, and they may start to change their mind about things of their own accord. This is one of the truly powerful things about artistic expression, and about interactive media especially. To put it simply, politics belong in games. ARK is another group that at the time of writing I can think of at least two real-world comparisons for. And while I am sympathetic, after all, I think we can all agree that fascism and racism are bad, I believe that violent protest is never justified, and that it will only work to weaken your position in the long run. Again, in the game we see this idea explored to its extreme, with Marchenko. He is a puppet of the Illuminati, who is being specifically wielded to break ARC and turn public opinion completely against augmentation. But it doesn't take a dark track. conspiracy, or an elaborate AI that exists to control public opinion, to break good ideas, not if the people speaking out on those ideas can be discredited and brought down. Your ideas may be bulletproof, but you are not. The moment you strike out in violence, you become the enemy your opposition has imagined you to be. You validate their hatred of you, and what's more, they can hold up your actions as a way to convince others that their hatred of you was righteous to begin with, to say nothing of how other opportunists from outside the main conflict may move in to further aggravate the situation. The moment you strike, you give them exactly what they want. Remember, it's not about what you do or why you do it, it's about what they say you do and why they say you do it. They will use your actions to discredit you and turn more people against you. This is the warning that Marchenko brings, the danger that violent action brings. In the end, change will not be won through force. Indeed, that is the weapon of dictators and oppressors. You are not warriors whose job it is to submit your enemy with force, you are, at best, debaters, whose job is to convince everyone on the fence that your cause is right and just. That is how things will ultimately be decided and change will be made. So, if it isn't obvious, this game was an incredible experience for me. It's just too bad that its initial launch was mired in the microtransaction controversy that led to an initial negative reception and coloured the experience for so many at the start. But I can't stress enough just how incredible and deep this world is. This is one of the best immersive sims, if not one of the best games I've ever played. And if for some reason you're here watching a full spoiler retrospective without having ever touched this game, then you really need to go and play this right now. You absolutely will not regret it. Mankind Divided ends at an interesting point. The battle is over, but the war rages on. Kind of like another abandoned Square Enix IP. And indeed, it seems that this whole affair has been constructed by Lucius simply to maneuver Adam, who it seems is in fact an unwitting sleeper agent, closer to actually meeting the elusive Janus. There are so many questions left unanswered, and motivations shrouded in mystery, and only the Dark Mastermind seems to know the whole story. And what of Adam? Is he a clone of the original? Sarif seems to think so. The way he speaks in that final call seems somewhat more distant, and using Adam Jensen's name in the third person, as if he was someone else. I'm pretty sure that clones of Adam do exist, but I think this one may be the original. It is quite clear that more was planned before this game even released, but for now, we still wait. Square Enix smelt more money and opportunity in licensing a live service game with Marvel's Avengers. A game that launched as disastrously as every other live service, was met with critical revile and has a seriously dwindling player base. That release cost the company a lot of money. Though, 
they've got plenty to spare if I'm being honest. And Eidos Montreal, apparently now on damage control, are at the time of writing working on a Guardians of the Galaxy game. And while I am a fan of these characters, I am very over the MCU, and have been since Age of Ultron. The movies are... fine. None of them are bad, but much like Star Wars, I'm simply overexposed to the brand and it doesn't excite me anymore. I really wish this wasn't the way the story, and indeed, this retrospective ends. Going out with a whimper rather than a bang. Unfortunately, for now at least, that's it. There isn't any more. <laughs> Hey everyone, if you're listening to this, then thank you so much. It's been a wonderful journey to revisit the world and these characters in order to make these videos. I've learned so much about these games that I didn't know before, and the Deus Ex community on Discord and Facebook has been wonderful to engage with. If you stuck with me through this whole thing, then I'm especially grateful. So from the bottom of my heart, truly, thank you. The video on Deus Ex Mods is in the works, though it may not be the next one. For now though, let's end positively, with a little hope, that the stars may yet align again for one last time, and Adam Jensen's story might yet see its final conclusion. Until then though, I've been Sam, and this was Deus Ex. Deus Ex.